thankful God's grace is enough today. Would you worship Him? Let's thank Him together all across this place tonight. Jesus, I thank You for Your grace today, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. The scriptural terminology, He said, my grace is still sufficient. It's sufficient. Praise God. You can be seated tonight. It's so good to have Miss Veronica Burgess with us tonight. And uh, she is visiting with the Warnickeys this evening in church. So good to have you with us on this Wednesday night. Yeah, let's go ahead. That's fine. And um, it's so good to have you with us tonight. It's good to have the Browns also back with us this evening. And uh, it's just a good night in the house of the Lord. And we're going to continue a series that we began uh, last Wednesday night entitled Rooted. I do believe it is the will of God for us to become established in the truth. And we're going to look at some core principles, and uh, I'm going to teach tonight. I am going to preach kind of a part of this on Sunday morning, um, and then a week from tonight we'll, we'll uh, go back into it again. I will take a break from it on Wednesday night. But uh, last week we talked about how God has much more in store for us beyond even salvation. Too many times we stop there and we think we've arrived. But God says, I want you to bear fruit. I want there to be uh, more things in your life than just me to save you. And I say this a lot when we're talking about salvation, but I want to reiterate it again tonight in the outset of this Bible study. Before you can be born again, you have to first die to sin. Now, I probably should have stated that last week because I didn't really say that a whole lot last week when we was talking about uh, thankful that we have been saved or been born again. But before we can be born again, we have to first be dead to sin. And so uh, I wanted to make sure and uh, say that today because repentance is not being born again. It has to happen to you before you can move to baptism. And it has to happen to you before you move on to being filled with the Holy Ghost. But repentance is not the full born again experience. And so tonight we are going to consider the process by which we made the decision or we make the decision to come to the Lord. Every individual's experience is going to be different in some ways. Um, But there are things that we all hold in common that happened to us. One of the terms that we discussed this past week in lesson one was that that we used, it was to describe salvation, it was the word redeemed. Everybody say redeemed. redeemed. Webster defines redeemed as to regain possession of by payment of a, specific, a specified amount, to pay off, to rescue, to save from sin and its consequences. I'm thankful today that we are uh, able to find many of the the things that the Lord did for us in that definition. But I want to look at it in a little different light tonight. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse number 25. I want you to look at what the Bible says. He says, If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother Sold. This is where the Hebrew word goel, which we get kinsman redeemer, uh, that concept from, to understand the full concept of the kinsman redeemer, or the Hebrew word for it is goel, you should read the book of Ruth. That's where we see that picture. Um, The law required that three requirements be met for the process of redemption. He must be the near of kin. He must be able. And lastly, and most importantly, really, he must be willing. Thank God that he became our kinsman redeemer, where which we can cry out to him as our father. And he is not just able, but he was willing to come and to die for us and to provide this way for us. The story of mankind is one of paradise lost, how it was creation being sold away from his perfect will. The question became, how can it be redeemed? Or how can it be regained? There are provisions that God made for redeeming us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19, the Bible says, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, 
But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. I still believe today that the blood of Jesus Christ is what covers us. That there's not a sin that the blood cannot remit or take away or cover us. I, I don't want... I'm thankful today that the blood of Jesus doesn't just cover. Because you know what? When you cover something, you always take the chance of it showing back up again. There was a vehicle that I had that I couldn't keep a certain part. A certain part on that vehicle, I couldn't keep paint on it. I think it was a defect was deep from, from the, the manufacturer. Because there was a certain part of that car, it didn't matter what I did, it would always, the paint would come off. I would cover that up as much as I could, but over time, it wore down. My Bible doesn't say that the blood of Jesus actually covers it. It says uh, it washes it away. It will make you white as snow. No, I'm thankful today that the blood of Jesus is not just to get me by for another year. That was the Old Testament way. But when Jesus Christ came and his blood was shed, it was the ultimate sacrifice that can take care of any sin, any situation, any background, any past. And he says, I can give you a glorious future through the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout, thank God for the blood. Romans chapter 5 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let's not forget the reason He came. I know there's a lot of ungodly things happening in our world today, but Christ died for them. Amen. For scarcely, the Bible says, for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God came for the lowliest of lows. For those that were ungodly. Those that did not deserve it. God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Can I say this to somebody in this room tonight? You may feel the furthest away from God. You may feel like there is no way I could ever live that life. Can I tell you Christ died for people just like you. I'm here to encourage us tonight. Paul said, don't forget, such were some of you. But now you are washed. Now you are sanctified. You have been made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am thankful. I am thankful for the blood. Have you ever considered how you came to be saved or born again? There's a lot of many different elements that we could talk about tonight that are necessary for salvation, mercy, grace, conviction, even the conscience to name a few. Ephesians 2 verses 8 through 9 says, It is by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is defined as to favor or to honor, goodwill, it's a favor that is rendered voluntarily. Divine love, God's divine protection bestowed freely upon human beings. A common definition of God's grace is the unmerited favor of God. We sing it a lot, amazing grace, because we understand that we are not here because of anything really that we did, but it was all about tapping into what He did for us. The born again experience. I want to look at this in retrospect tonight because many in this room have been born again. I want us to look at this. How did you come to be here? Think about that. Asking yourself that question. How did you come to be here? The Bible says we are born of the will of God. John chapter 1 verses 12 through 13. But as many as received him... To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. Now, we understand also that 
No man in John chapter 6, the Bible says, can come to Jesus except the Father which hath sent him or sent me, draw him. He said, I will raise him up at the last day. We got to understand, I, I hated this, this statement that used to be said so much, I found the Lord. No, honey, you never found him. He found you. And uh, there was an old Southern Gospel song that came out. I say old, it came out a few years ago. He came looking for me. The picture there is a beautiful picture and it's biblical that the Father must first draw us before we ever come to the house of God. Before you realized God was working on your heart, God was drawing you to a place where He could speak to you. No man can come to Him unless He first is drawn. And then the Bible says the Lord searches the heart. In Acts chapter 16, a certain woman named Lydia, she's a seller of purple and of the city of Thyatira, the Bible says that she worshipped God, but she heard the, the preacher and, and, and whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. I want to tell you tonight, the Lord will open our heart. He will show us where we're missing the mark. The Bible, Brother Brown even calls this godly sorrow. When people come to me and say, I don't know why I feel so bad. I stop them right there and I tell them, I know why. That's godly sorrow. Because if you didn't feel bad, you wouldn't stop doing it. If you didn't feel convicted about it, you wouldn't change. Repentance is more than just saying, I'm sorry. Godly sorrow worketh to repentance. It's that I'm sorry feeling that will push me to the point that I say, I'm not doing it anymore. I need a change in my life. The Bible calls this godly sorrow. How else can you explain feeling bad for doing something and it wasn't the first time you had done it, but it was the first time you felt bad about it? <laughs> it's God opening your heart. It's God trying to show you what you need to change. And then He will even place somebody in your life with the truth and give you the power to make changes that are needed. And, and, and uh, Brother Eric, he may be watching tonight at work. Brother Eric Jones, he texts me, the other night he said, thank you for using my story. I'm glad it's, it's still being able to, to minister to people. And, 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 and we even had this conversation the other day. Those changes that were so desperately needed, he received the power to do that. From the moment he started repenting, there was a strength that started coming to him as he kept walking closer to God. Even to the point where now he's filled with the Holy Ghost and he's starting to see scriptures in different ways than he ever has before. And we'll have biblical text messages back and forth. He's asking, what does this scripture mean or what does that mean? mean and, and, and sometimes I tell them I'll get right back with you on that because I'm not at a place I can respond to you but that is the plan of God it's changes that will keep happening in us as we get closer to God what incidents happened that began to draw you to the Lord I want you to think about that what were some things that happened to you that said you know what I, 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 I'm tired of this I've got to get closer to God no I did not say accidents I said incidents it was not an accident that God caused incidents to happen in the process of getting your attention. So don't write something else as, well, that's just an accident. That that preacher just ended up at the right place at the right time. No, that was a, a God moment. That was an incident that was God ordained. Praise God. I still believe the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. I still believe God needs to order our path in our day that we come across hungry hearts and souls that need Him. Also, and this is a word that we don't use very often in the religious world today, but God give us a fresh baptism of it, please. And that is conviction. Was God drawing you from where you were to where He is? How did you feel as God worked in your life? You could feel as God was pulling at your heartstrings. I could remember sitting through sermons saying, Oh dear God, just please let Him give the altar service because I'm ready to go right now. I don't think I can sit here much longer. I remember sitting in services where, where sometimes we didn't get to the end of the sermon where people would begin to flood the altars because of conviction that would begin to fall. God help us get back to that point where we are so hungry for the word of God that when it goes forth, it draws us to a place that we have to respond. And then after that, that we come to that moment, then is where probably you, began, you thought I was going to begin teaching tonight, and that is the word we're all so familiar with, and that is repentance. Did you realize there were so many things that happened to get you to what we would like to say is the first step? 
in the plan of salvation. I hate using that because there's so many steps. And sometimes it's more steps for some people than others because uh, I, I've seen people pray to get the Holy Ghost and pray 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 and pray. And, pray. and finally the Lord reveals to them, if you'll lay this down, I'll fill you with my spirit. But then I've also seen people that were struggling with the very same thing receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then they felt the conviction to lay it down. So I can't really, I do know from this point on that there is some things from the Word of God that says must happen for us to be saved. Getting to this point, there may be different variables. For the Danny's testimony may be different than somebody else in this room tonight up to this point. But here is a common factor that's going to happen and it is everybody is going to be brought to a place. If you're going to be saved, you're going to be brought to a place of repentance. How you get there may be different. Some people may have a terrible car accident and that be the very thing that shakes them. I've got to make some changes because I could have died. I've got to make sure. I've seen people that there would have to be sickness or whatever to come into their life to get their attention. But whatever it takes, you will be brought to a place of repentance. The first major step, I would say, that we take toward God. Folks, belief in God is important, but you can believe without there being any action involved if you're not careful. That's why I say repentance is the actual first step or action that we did in our coming to God. So what is repentance? Repentance is remorse or contrition for past conduct or sin. To be truly sorry for your mistakes and making a 180 degree turn, not going back. The original word meant to do an about face. So how serious is repentance? I'll tell you how serious it is in three words. God demands it and if God demands it it's a pretty big issue Acts chapter 17 verse number 30 says the times of this ignorance God winked at but now everybody say now, now. commandeth all men everybody say all men all everywhere boy he's not leaving anybody out is he now he's commanding all men in case you're still wondering about it everywhere <laughs> to repent a man one day was on his way to catch a train and he had to get to work before because he had an important meeting. He had to catch the 805 train. Now, it had rained the night before and the man was rushing out the door. As he opened the back door, there was his little son playing in the mud. He was busy rubbing mud all over his face, mud on his arms, like little boys will do. He's just having a good old time playing in the country mud. The father, intent on catching the 805 train, says, no problem, son, you keep playing. I'm going to jump over you. About the time he goes to jump over, his son raises his arm. He says goodbye, and he rushes out of the house. He slips, trips over his son, falls into the mud next to his son. So now the father's in the mud, and the son is in the mud. But the father has to catch the 805 and he had a place to go because of where he needed to go. He didn't stay in the mud and play with his son. His son was enjoying playing in the mud. Wasn't trying to go anywhere. But the father has a train to catch. So he jumps out of the mud, but as, as, as quick as he could, and he cleans himself off the best that he could. And he takes off running because he's got a train to catch. He had to catch the 805. There was, there was going to be a restroom in the train uh, depot where he could clean up the dirt that he's accumulated during the time that he was in the mud. But right now, that's not what's important. He's got a train that he's got to catch. You're finally getting there with me. There's two kinds of people today. There are some that are playing in the mud. And there's others that's trying to get somewhere. There's other people that are in the mud, but they don't want to be there. Maybe you've slipped in the mud. Maybe you've walked right into the mud. But now it's dawned on you. There is a train that we've got to catch. There is a place that we've got to go. There is a God that I've got to get to know. I've got a life that God wants me to live. There are experiences that he wants me to have. I want all of God that he's got for me. Maybe you've decided, I'm going to leave the mud. I'm going to repent of my sin. I'm going to turn from my mistakes. I'm going to be born again of water and spirit because the most important thing is I've got a train to catch. I'm not planning on living here. I'm planning on making heaven my home. Can I tell somebody tonight, he's got the blood that'll transform you. 
getting to the destination that God wants you to get to. Sin always has its consequences. But the good news is God's grace is greater than your sin. Praise God. Here's some further thoughts on what God asks of us. First thing he says, you need to forsake your way and thoughts and you need to return to the Lord. Isaiah 55 and 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord. And God will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. In other words, we were guilty, but God says, I'll pardon it. Second thing that God asks of us is, I'll forgive it if you'll confess it. So that's the problem. We don't want to confess it. But the Bible says you actually activate a promise if you'll confess it. First John chapter 1, verse number 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And we'll stop right there and shout, but don't forget, He still wants to cleanse he wants to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we're not careful, unrighteous actions and attitudes will creep into a once righteous life. So he says, I don't want to just forgive you of your sin. I want to help you stay holy. I want to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And then thirdly, he wants you to walk uprightly. You know, we loved it when Matthew first started taking steps and Elise started first taking steps. But I'll tell you what, Brother White, nothing made me more nervous than to see him fall near a coffee table. You know, we've been blessed so far. We hadn't had to be in the emergency room a lot with our kids. But, I mean, you hear horror stories. My own brother fell on Mitchell Street and right in the middle of his forehead, or no, it was right, right over an eyebrow, and uh, had to have... You know, a little bit of doctrine up there. and You hear of kids falling. But you know what? Just like I, I rejoiced when the kids first started walking, I really got happy when they caught the hang of it. Yeah. Now we spend the rest of our time telling them, sit down and shut up. You know, don't, don't we? You know, Come walk to me, walk to me. Now we're like, please, quit walking. Just sit down for a minute. <laughs> you know, the Lord gets excited when you learn how to read His Word and Walk uprightly. It's a natural tendency when you first start getting into church. and There's a lot of mistakes that get made. There's a lot of boo-boos that happen spiritually. And, and, and we'll fall. And, but the good thing is, is that there is always God's people and God's hand to help us get back up and keep marching forward. And, and, and yet the longer that you are in this thing, the, the less frequent those falls happen. The Bible says, Whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved. But he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. If we'll just stay close to God, He takes care of a whole lot of things, folks. Repentance is not just for the unsaved. Can I say that? Repentance is also for the saint. In prayer, we are taught to ask for forgiveness. As we forgive others. A whole lot more response than I expected. that, Because it's a whole lot easier for us to be thankful God forgives us. A whole lot easier than forgiving somebody else. The Bible says, when thou prayest in Matthew 6. Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Because they love to pray standing in the synagogues. They love to stand in the corners of the streets and be seen of men. Verily, I say unto you, he said, you want the reward? That's it. That's all they're getting. They have their reward. But when you pray, he said, I want you to go into your closet. And when you've shut your door, pray to the Father that's in secret. And your Father that sees in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask of him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then we stop there, but that's not where Jesus stopped talking. He went on to say, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, it's going to be a bad day on judgment day. Your heavenly Father will not forgive your trespasses. This forgiving other people is as important as repentance. Because it tells me it don't matter how much I repent. If I can't forgive somebody, it ain't going to matter. There's another scripture. I don't, I don't remember if I put this in here or not. I've, I've already been studying for Sunday. Here it is. When there's problems between friends, we're going to make that right. And you know what? Don't matter how hard Brother Amos hurt me. He ain't never done it, but anyway. No matter how hard Brother Amos hurt me, you know what that means? I still have to look him in the eye. And no matter how bad I don't want to forgive, yeah. I still am under the obligation to forgive. Amen. And you know why? Because what is being a Christian supposed to be anyways? To be like Him. And if I want Him on Judgment Day to overlook my mistakes, I know there have been times where I've, I've slapped Him in the face and didn't mean to. But if I want Him to forgive me of those moments... And I need to forgive somebody else of those same moments. I want us to understand tonight that forgiveness of somebody else is a heaven or hell issue. We, 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 try to, we, try to, you know, we try to classify sins and say, well, this ain't a heaven or hell issue. Friend, when we start going, first off, when you start going against authority in your life, you just made it a heaven or hell issue. But when we start developing that kind of spirit, we get into a dangerous place. But this word tells me this really literally is a heaven or hell issue no matter how you slice it and dice it and try to mix it up. He said, if you don't forgive somebody else, I'm not going to forgive you. Look at Matthew 5, 23. If you bring a gift to the altar and you remember your brother has ought against thee, not you have an ought against them. Brother Steve, I've had to go to people that I didn't feel like I should have been the one apologizing at that point. I feel like I didn't do anything wrong. But you know what? The Bible talks about being a peacemaker. And sometimes that means confronting as much as it means holding my mouth shut. And so before I can go to the altar and pray and believe God's going to hear and receive my offering of thanksgiving. He says, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember you've got an ought with somebody. He says, you leave there that gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled. To thy brother. And then he says, come back and offer the gift. But he said, I'm not receiving your gift until you go and give a gift to somebody else, and that is the forgiveness from your heart. So that tells me I have to forgive to be in the plan of God. Now, you can tell by looking at my hair, I don't get them. A lot of men don't get them. But some of you women have gotten perms before. And these perms... What it does is they change the texture of your hair from one thing to another. And they say after applying the perm to your hair, the professional hairdresser uses a neutralizing shampoo. And the reason they do that is to assure that the harsh chemicals that they used did not do lasting damage to your hair. Christians, Harvest Church... We are called to be peacemakers. And we are called, the Bible actually calls it a ministry. The ministry of reconciliation. And when the ministry of reconciliation is active, yes, people get hurt in the church house like they get hurt anybody in, anywhere else. But if there is the ministry of reconciliation, it works as a neutralizer so that there is no lasting damage and souls end up lost. What it does is it shows the love of Christ that says we're all human, we're all trying to make it to heaven, and we're going to love God together. And when we fail, 
The Bible says when we fail, if we will confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive and cleanse us. Go to 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to give a little more context to that verse that we read earlier in verse 9, but I'm going to go to verse 7. He says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. I, I start questioning people's walk with God when they don't want to fellowship. Because he says, if you're walking in the light as he's in the light, you're going to have fellowship. And, he said, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, he said, you're deceiving yourself. And the truth's not in us. But then he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. And he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. I think I used it in a sermon back in maybe 2013, 2014, if, if I'm remembering right. Because I, I pulled the sermon up, and I may have used it one other time. The story goes that Sally and Jack had went to Grandma and Grandpa's house to visit. And it was the summertime. And uh, while they were there, Grandpa took them, out to Jack, he took them out to show Jack how to use a slingshot. It was one of those homemade slingshots. I, never, well, I think I still got the one Brother White made me as a kid. And uh, those little homemade slingshots. And so he said, Jack, I'm going to show you how to use this slingshot. And Jack got really good at it in just a bit, small amount of time. And after a little while, Grandpa says, I got to go, boys. I got I to I gotta go. He's talking to both grandkids, Sally and Jack. He said, I got to go and do a few things. And, and uh, so I'm going to leave you all out here. Just remember, uh, Grandma's probably going to want you all back to the house in about an hour or so. And so... Jack, in his new slingshot, he's aiming for something else, and that rock got a little off, and uh, Jack ends up hitting one of Grandpa's ducks in the head and kills the duck. Sally said, ooh, I'm going to tell. Jack is terrified. Please, please don't tell, you know. <laughs> Sally said, okay, I won't tell. I'm going to remember this, but I ain't going to tell. Kids get back, and Grandma says, Sally, why don't you help me clean up the house? While Jack gets cleaned up for, uh, from being outside with this sly look, Sally says, Grandma, Jack would love to do the dishes. Wouldn't you, Jack? Jack don't mind doing the dishes. In fact, Jack, tell Grandma how much you love doing the dishes. And she leans over to him and whispers where Grandma can't hear, Remember the duck. <laughs> oh, Jack. He said, oh, yeah, Grandma, I love doing dishes. <laughs> He's determined. She's determined to get the housework done. And she says, okay, okay, while you do the dishes, me and Sally are going to vacuum the floor. Sally, go get the vacuum cleaner. She says, oh, Grandma, let me tell you about Jack and his vacuuming skills. That, that boy is a natural-born vacuum person. I'm telling you, come on. Jack, tell Grandma how much you like to vacuum. Remember the duck. Oh, he's grimacing at this point. Grandma, I love being a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, I do. He's boiling by now because he's trapped. He's not only trapped for right now, but he's trapped, he thinks, for the rest of his life. Every time Grandma asks, me to do, or asks her to do something, she's going to remember that duck. So later that day, after this had went on all day long, Grandpa comes in, he notices what happened. And he noticed that Jack has done a whole lot more of his share of the work that was really assigned for two grandkids. And Grandpa said, Jack, let's go outside on the back porch a minute. He said, now Jack, you may think I'm mean for doing this, but I actually saw what happened earlier today. He said, let me tell you something, Jack. I know about the duck. But I didn't say anything because I wanted to see how long you were going to let somebody else make you their slave. All you had to do from from being held hostage to your situation was to tell me what you did. Can I tell somebody tonight, God knows you killed the duck. And you don't have to hide it. Because you ain't hiding nothing. And the devil wants to keep you held hostage and hold over your head what you've done. But the Bible says if you'll just confess that sin to God. He's faithful and just to forgive us. We can release the hold the devil has on our lives by literally just bringing it to God and saying, God, forgive me. 
If we sin, the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father. He says, my little children, these things right unto you, you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he goes on to say he's the propitiation for our sins. And, 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 and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We get in under that. Advocate means to speak, to plead, or argue in favor of. In other words, when you're born again, when you fall, your heavenly Father is going to stand up for you. There will be people that will try to talk about you and they'll try to put you down. You don't have to say much because you got an advocate with the Father. As a child of God, we strive to live above sin. For Christ came to save us from our sin. We cannot be saved in sin. We must be saved from our sin. And if we do fall, if we do fail, we need to stop trying. To, to fix our own lives, but rather repent and move forward and allow God to show us the changes that need to be made. Let us never forget, whether we are a saint or a sinner, and I'm almost done tonight, that there is a positive power to repentance. God still rules in the heavens. He still forgives anybody that, who will obey His word regardless of who they are. Doesn't matter how many sins you've put on the record. God says, I'll forgive you of all your trespasses. There's only one sin that God won't forgive, and that's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. That's a whole other Bible study for another time. Tell the world about the hope you have. The first reason you can give them that hope is, I have repented of my sins, and God has forgiven me. See, if you have a checkbook and you get a bank statement, let's just say their balance don't agree with yours. There's a problem. There has to be reconciliation. The only way to get that reconciliation is to find out where the problem is. You have to be able to identify why are my numbers not matching up and where is the error. When bank balances don't match, we don't just throw our hands up and say, it'll work out. We work to find the error and then we fix it. Can I tell you tonight, Jesus Christ is the fix to the error of sin. That He came to reconcile us back to Him. To right what was wrong. He walked on this earth for 33 years to fulfill all righteousness. And to bring us into balance with the righteousness of God. He did this for us because we could not do it. For ourselves. I'm going to ask the singers to come back tonight. We're going to close with another song this evening. And, and I want us to remember. It's not by our own might. The Bible talks about it's not even by our own willpower. Our own spirit. But it's by the spirit of the Lord. Or the power of God. That we're able to live. And, and, and do the things that we're doing. Paul would talk about the, the living and breathing. And, and, and everything being in God. It's in Him that we move, we breathe, we have our being. The Apostle Peter and John were brought in before the Sanhedrin and they said, how did you do all this? And they said, wait a minute, it ain't us. It's God that works in us. There's nothing that we can say or do, folks, that will forgive us and fix our lives. But oh, I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us today. Aren't you thankful for that? Let's lift our hands and love the Lord in the closing moments of this service tonight. Lord Jesus.